people, ignorant people, people of all colors, crippled people, healthy people, celebrities, and people that nobody knows. He ordered them once in their life to go there and just go around this house, not worshiping the house, but just going around that house saying, under your service, oh God, Oh, God, forgive me. Have mercy upon me. And human beings just doing this here as a tradition of who? Tradition of Abraham, the father of all the monotheistic religions. That was his tradition. When the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, came, he was only following whose tradition? The tradition of Abraham. And Abraham is the father of Isaac and Ismael. And Jesus Christ came from that line. And the Muhammad came from that line. Jesus came from one side, Muhammad came from the other side. So all of us are cousins anyway. <laughs> See? Now these are the pillars of Islam, the five pillars. Very easy for anybody to do. It takes time, it takes time, a little practice, a little reminder. No one becomes a Muslim and just does it automatically, even those who are born Muslims. They don't do it automatically because it's a ritual. It's a formula. It takes a little bit of effort to do all five. To say there's none to be worshipped, none to be recognized, none to be obeyed, no, no one to be submitted to except the Creator, it takes at least a saying of a word. You have to fix your mouth to say that and to say, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God, that he is a messenger of God, that he is a messenger. If you don't say he is the messenger of God, the final messenger of God, to say he is a messenger calls for you to at least look into his life, to at least reject it and determine that he is or he isn't. You could just say, no, he wasn't, and just walk away. But shame on you if he was. Before you reject, because your father said, your mother said, because you read, because you were conditioned, because you were prejudiced, because you were born, because you were turned that way, and you were told this way, shame on you that you don't take the time and objectively look into the life of the prophet, peace and blessing upon him, and see if he qualifies to be a messenger or a prophet of God. You need to do that. Because if he isn't a messenger of God, you should be able to discover that quickly. You should see the contradictions quickly. And if he is a messenger of God, you should be honest enough to say, well, he does have a definite relationship with Jesus Christ. There is a definite relationship there. He definitely is a descendant of Abraham. There is a relationship there. Yes, this book, the Quran, has a semblance to the words of Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon. And yes, they are calling upon that same God. And yes, what he has been ordered to do it's what Abraham and Moses and all of them has been ordered to do. Yes, there is a semblance there. Now you look for the contradictions and you look for the semblances and you look for the evidence. And after that, you ask your heart, can this man be a prophet? Can this man be a messenger? Is he qualified by his character? Is he qualified by his behavior? Is he worthy of any human being to follow him? If he is, then he's worthy of you to consider. We say, we bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of God. Yes, and we accept the responsibility to pray five times a day. Now, if you say you only want to pray one time a day because that's enough, okay. Then you just pray one time a day then. If you think that's what's been written, you think that's what's been fixed, then you just pray one time a day. Now, if you think it's enough for you to just get up on Sunday and eat a sandwich and go to church, and uh, pray once a week, you say, well, I said I do all my prayers at one time, and God got to accept that. If you think that's enough, do that. If you think that's what's fixed and that's what's been written, uh, bring your evidence and bring your proof, and you do, do that. If you want to pray once a year, you want to jump up down and clap your hands, and that's your prayer, then do, do that. But we say there is a formula for the prayer. Every prophet of Almighty God was sent with a formula. They wasn't just jumping up and down and doing push-ups and spinning around and dip, do different things. And what you want me to do today, Peter? What you want me to do today, Jesse? What you want me? No, they were following what God told them to do. If God said bow, they bowed. If God said stand, stand. If God said prostrate, prostrate. If God said sing a hymn, sing a hymn. That's what they did. 
So you can't tell me that you're following one of the prophets of God, one of the messengers of God, one of the godly men, and you don't know how he prayed. That's the first thing you need to know. How, how did he pray? How he was communicating? What's the area code? What's the postcode? How you dial up? Because if your mobile phone got a different number than mine, and you know, if you want to call me, you can't call Judy's number. <laughs> so if human beings are smart enough to create mobile phones that uh, millions of people in the world using the same satellite, using the same waves, but all of them can be rung up independently, then what you think? Just to, you just call on God any way you want to. God ain't got no area code. God don't have no prescription. God don't have no methodology for you to pray. He don't have no conditions. You can just get up in the morning and just be dirty and groggy and just get up and pray. You could just be drunk and come home and just you're going to just fall down and pray. You could just have sexual relationships with your wife or husband and get up and don't wash up and just pray. You can just pray to God getting off the toilet, on the toilet. You can pray to God any way you want to. You could be thieving and lying and stealing, shooting drugs, still praying. No, God has to have a system, a condition for you to pray. And God has given the prophets a system and a way for you to pray. Now, I don't say that if anybody prays in any way they got to pray. If you call on God in any condition, you could be drunk. You could be dirty. You could be wrong. You could be a criminal. But if you call on God, he will hear you. But that's not prayer. That's called an invocation. God hears the invocation of everyone. But he has given you and I a prescription, a methodology of how to relate to him. Now, Islam also has not only just a pillars of faith, Islam also has what's called the Arukanul Islam, Arukanul Iman. What is the Arukanul Islam? We believe in Almighty God. We believe in his angels. Yeah, we believe in angels. They're not spooks. We believe in angels. In the scriptures, speaking about angels all the time. Speak about the angel of death. Talking about the angel that bring the scribes, the angels that record our actions, the angels that stand by the throne, the angel of the hellfire, the angels at the gate of paradise. It speaks about those angels that are with human beings that guide them. It speaks about angels of God all throughout the scripture. And we believe in angels. Gabriel was an angel. You call, some people call him the Holy Ghost or the sacred spirit. Yes, he was that sacred spirit. He brought the revelation to every prophet that ever came in this world. Call his name is Gabriel. Gabriel. We say Jibreel in Arabic. In English, you might say Gabriel, that great angel. We believe in all the angels. We don't have to qualify them. God has mentioned them. Prophets have mentioned them. We believe in those angels as they have been mentioned. And there are some angels of Almighty God. They only serve him. Angels are not like humans. Angels don't question. They don't have their own will. They don't do what they want to do. Angels only submit. That's all they do is what God ordered them to do. They are servants, but they're not humans, and they don't eat, and they don't drink, and they don't marry, and they don't have interrelationships, uh, and they don't the rebellion, and they ain't got their own opinions. They serve him. They are angels who are going around the throne of God only praising God. Not that God need them to do that, but that's their job. They're angels that go back up and forth through the heavens and the earth at all times, shifting, taking and recording what human beings do. Don't say, ain't nobody recording what I'm doing. If I took a picture, click up, you, I got it. Now, if you got the camera, I, can, I got that for, forever, I got that picture. So you think that God don't have a way to take pictures and also to record? He got angels that does that. Not he, that he needs that, because God knows everything, but he has assigned them to do that. There's angels over the waters who guard the mountains, who guard the rivers. And when God want to create uh, uh, what we call some kind of catastrophe in the earth, if God wants to make an earthquake, tidal wave, if he wants to send a wind and blast some people off the earth, he sends some angels just, whoosh, they just come through and the earth flips over. Because angels had that kind of power. So we believe in those angels. We believe in all the books of God, all the books. We believe in the Torah. Moses received the Torah. You call it the Pentateuch. 
or the five books. We believe that as they were sent, not as they are. We believe as they were sent. Yes, we believe. We believe in the book that was sent to David. You call it the Psalms, we call it the Zabur. We believe it as it was sent, not as it had been recorded. Some other people wrote some other songs in there, put some other stuff in there. We believe the Psalms did come to David by revelation, Daoud. We believe upon them, but not as they are, because they have been changed. And the Bible scholars will tell you they have been changed. We also believe in the, to the Torah that was sent to Moses. Yes, we believe that. We believe in the Injil, or the Evangel, as you call it. You call it Evangel. The good news, we call it Injil, that was sent to Esau. You call him Jesus. We believe upon that. What we, what we believe it exactly as he said it, not how somebody else edited it. As he said it, not how it was edited. We'll come back to that. We believe upon all the books that were sent, and we believe upon all the prophets and all the messengers. All those that have been mentioned, those that have not been mentioned. Our prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he said that verily Almighty God has sent into this world 144,000, 124,000. 124,000 prophets and messengers, but he only named 25 in the Quran. Because those 25 are the major ones. <coughs> And those 25, we know their names. And among those 25, five are the major, major prophets. Abraham, Moses. Abraham, Moses. Noah, alayhi salam. Esau, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam. Five major prophets. And Amazingly, in the Quran, although this is a book revealed to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, which prophet do you think is mentioned the most in the Quran? No, Moses. Moses mentioned more in the Quran than any other prophet. And Allah builds most of the stories of the Quran around Moses because Moses was an unusual prophet. And yes, Jesus Christ is mentioned in the Quran, everything about Jesus mentioned in the Quran, and about his mother too. Not only how he was born, but also how miraculous his mother was born. And John the Baptist, and how he was born. Think about John the Baptist. Zechariah was his father, in case you don't remember that. And Zechariah, when, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when Yahya was born, John, we call him, Zechariah was 90, was, I'm sorry, he was 110. So he was surprised when God told him he was going to have a son. I'd be surprised, too. <laughs> he was surprised. He said, God, how, how am I going to have a son? How am I going to have a son when, when I'm old? And I don't have any water in me any longer. That's what he said, you see? He, he wasn't impotent. He's a little bit past that. He's a little bit past, you know, it's like, and his wife, she was 90. Now think about that. She was past menopause. She was really paused. <laughs> so you want to think about a miracle, phenomenal birth. Think about John the Baptist. Father was 110. His mother was 90. So those of you who are trying to get pregnant by uh, vitro and fertilization, what do you call it? Huh? What do you call it? In vitro fertilization, thank you very much, brother. Uh, uh, artificial insemination, same thing, isn't it? Something like that? Yes. You don't even need to do that. Just, just, just pray. Let things happen. Yes, give the sister a hand, inshallah. Thank you. So, think about this. We believe in all the prophets of Almighty God, all, every single one of them. We make no distinction upon, um, among them, meaning say, we don't say one is better than the other. No, we make a distinction only to say one is first, another one was last. One was first, another one was last. Adam was the first man, first human being, first prophet. Adam, first man, first creature, first prophet to human beings. 
Now, you want to think about a miraculous birth, think about Adam. He ain't had no mother or father. Check that out. <laughs> and then Eve, think about that woman. She had no mother or father either. She's born from her husband. <laughs> That's the way the Bible said it now. And I believe what the Bible said. I believe what God said, that he created Adam. He had no mother and father. So what's, more, what's harder? And we do believe that Jesus Christ, by the way, we do believe as Muslims that Jesus Christ was born over only from his mother. That's it. Was no man involved, period. Jesus Christ was born without the intervention of sperm. We believe that, absolutely, because God does what he want to do by his word. If God created Adam by his word, created Eve by his word, created John by his word, then he can create Jesus by his word. Because what's more difficult? Create a man, no father, mother. Create a woman with no father and mother, or to create Another man was just the mother. Which one is more difficult? God do whatever he want to do. Jesus is the word of God because by God's word he came about. And by God's word Mary became pregnant. So yes, he is God's word. We believe that. And he's a special spirit that God sent into this world. And we believe that. So we Muslims believe in the angels of God, the books of God, the prophets of God, we believe in the day of judgment. Yes, we do believe that there's going to be a day when you're going to be judged, when all the books will be open and everything will be balanced, and you will be asked about what you did, how you lived your life, what you did with that body that you were given, how you used it, how you spent your money, how you spent your time, even how you used water. You will be asked. And you won't lie that day because you won't be able to speak that day. Your books will speak for you. You say, what book can that be? Well, you think about the subconscious, and you ask psychologists about the subconscious. The psychiatrist will tell you that the subconscious mind has recorded every single thing that has ever come across your mind, the subconscious. Anybody here is a psych psychiatrist or psychologist? Anybody here has a background like that? Then you go, and you check. Go into Google Giggle or Gaggle, whatever <laughs> search engine you got, and you ask about the human mind. And you will find out that the human mind is fantastic apparatus because it has the conscious part, which we are witnessing, which only carries a little bit of, uh, of in, uh, what you call it, uh, information. But the hard drive, we call it, huh? the subconscious is the hard drive. And that hard drive stores every single thing. There's not a sound, there's not a word, there's not an image, there's not a feeling, there's nothing you have ever done or anything around you from the time you were in the womb of your mother that your subconscious mind has not recorded. <coughs> now, now that's, that's a little bit heavier than Polaroid and Kodak. <laughs> And when you stand before God, it's easy for God to bring your book forward because your brain, <laughs> see? The subconscious just be reversed, that's it. And it'll be right in front of you. When you look at that book, it's talking to you. It is you. It is your book. And you will say, my, what a book that is. It didn't leave out nothing small or great, but it's got everything in it. But you will only be thinking that because on that day, you won't be able to speak. The things that couldn't speak on that day of judgment will speak. The hands will speak. The feet will speak. What they did and where they went. The rocks and the trees that didn't speak before will say, he sat next to me. He sat on me. He walked this way. He lied sitting next to me. Everything that couldn't talk, animals that couldn't talk will talk. Trees, birds, water will talk. Everything will talk that day except you and me. So do all your talking now. <laughs> We believe in the judgment. We believe that God has the ability to create his creatures, to preserve what they have done, and we believe that God has the ability to set scales up and to judge them. Because there are, there are courts in this world, this judge, right? You believe that somebody do something wrong, you say, I'm gonna sue you. You believe there's some justice somewhere, there's some justice. So if human beings can seek justice from human beings, you know the creator who has made the human beings has his own way of justice. And keep this in mind, brothers and sisters. Oppression has its own price. 
when humans cannot get justice from other humans for oppression, it has its own price. And yes, I appreciate living in the West and all the opportunities that it gives to me, but I know there's a price for the oppression that these countries have done in the world. And we sit back and live our lives and enjoy ourselves, and we see the oppression throughout the world, but there's a price for it. And we are paying for it. Where we're living at today, Australia, you know your country better than I do. Australia, Great Britain, America, France, Germany, all these sophisticated countries, advanced countries, they have the highest level of suicide, highest level of divorce, highest level of child <coughs> pedophilia, highest level of pornography, highest level of murder, highest level of drug addiction, highest level of prostitution. Now, this is a fact. Don't blame me. Don't get an attitude with me. <laughs> These are facts because there's a price to pay and the family has been destroyed, totally destroyed. The family has been disintegrated completely. McDonald's, Burger King, and, and Pizza Hut took the whole family table away. <laughs> Families don't even come together anymore. Mom and dad is working double jobs, and the kids is latchkey kids. The kids got their mobile phones, got their own partners, everybody. My, mommy got a TV, daddy got a TV, Janie got a TV, Tommy got a TV, and grandma and grandpa, they in the old age home. They got a TV too. <laughs> That's the price that we pay. So we believe in judgment, and there will be a time that each one of us will be individually accounted for. Books will be balanced. Accounts will be brought forward. And the creator who is just, he will not be unjust to anyone. He has no reason to be unjust to you. He will give you what your hand calls for. If there's anything he's going to give you more than what he should, it won't be punishment. It'll be mercy because he's a loving God. Anyone that's due mercy will get more mercy than they and most of the mercy, you, you're getting it right now, most of us. Most of us have what we don't even deserve. People talking about, I work for what I got. You lying. You didn't work for everything you got. You didn't work for your eyes. You didn't work for your brain. You didn't work to live here. You didn't pay no rent on that body you in. So how you work for everything you got? I ain't got to praise God. I got everything I got by hard work. You get sick and see if you can get well just by your work. So we will have to answer and be accountable. We believe in the day of judgment. And how will the day of judgment come about? We believe that we will be resurrected out of the grave. Now you can go and get yourself cremated or creamed, whatever you want to. Just tell somebody to turn you into cream and turn you into water or put you through one of those, what are those machines they call it? Nanotechnology. You heard of nanotechnology. That means they put you through that tube and they create some, just turn you into something smaller in the DNA and turn you into something else. So I ain't got to worry about no judgment because I've been turned into something else. I've been recycled. <laughs> turn me into ashes because if there is a hellfire, I don't want to go there, so just burn me up right now. <laughs> Throw me out in the ocean. But it is not the body. That has nothing to do with the issue. The creator who has created in the beginning, he is the able to create all over again and he will call you back together from wheresoever you are in the earth and bring you back all the way to your fingerprints. It'll be the same you. Does the one who created us in the beginning have that power? Do you think so? The one that created us in the beginning with all this diversity, does he have the power to, by his own will, create us all over again? He will and he says he will, because that's the way you're going to be judged. And you will not be raised up as a Christian, and you will not be raised up as a Jew or a Buddhist or as a uh, pretty lady, or you will not be raised up as a banker, you will not be raised up as a black or a white tall, you will not be raised up as an aristocrat, you will not be raised up, but you'll be raised up barefoot and naked. And the prophet's wife said, oh, messenger of Allah, what do you mean we're going to be standing there naked? Won't people be ashamed? He said, no, on that day, there'll be so much trauma, ain't nobody going to be asking about it. 
me so much trauma. Human beings would be in so much trauma that day, waiting for their judgment. In Q, can you think about it? The prophet, peace and blessed be upon him, said on that day, the whole earth will be destroyed and a new earth will be created. And that new earth that will be created, all the living beings that have been destroyed will be inside of it. And then God will send clouds, and those clouds will rain sperm. And that sperm will come down and hit the ground and be the sperm just like your father. And when it hits the ground, you'll come out of the ground like a mushroom. That's what the prophet said. He said, like vegetables. They just come up out of the earth just like that. Just like you were when you came from your mother's womb. Only thing you would be an adult that day. Destitute, begging, sweating, and fear, waiting to be judged. I won't go too far. I don't want nobody to have no heart attack sitting in here. Because we don't like to think about dying. We don't like to think about judgment. We certainly don't like to be thinking about standing for no judgment. But it's true. Because the prophets, all of them said it. That there will be a day that all of us will be judged and the scales will be set up. And you would get from God what your hands call forth. And if you get anything extra, it will not be punishment. It will be what? Mercy. So these are their beliefs. Now, there are some misconceptions about Islam that I want to deal with for a few moments, some misconceptions. They say that we are terrorists. They say we are fanatics. They say we are extremists. They say we are repressionists. Yes, there are some Muslims who definitely they are terrorists. No doubt about that. We have to admit that. There's some people who call themselves Muslims. They, they get so frustrated. They went to such an extreme of frustration. They don't know what else to do that yes, they have done some acts, or allegedly, they have done some actions. And we have to admit, I don't know exactly who they are, because I wasn't there, and most of the people who say weren't there. But no doubt, I do believe there is some truth to the fact that some Muslims, especially in the last 20, 30 years, have been engaged in some terrorist acts. There's no doubt about that. We don't have to name them. There have been certainly some who have done that. And those actions have caused a certain amount of destruction, tragedy, horror, injury, death to human beings. And we say as Muslims, we don't support that because our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he didn't tell us to act as a terrorist. He didn't tell us to be reactionaries. Everything the prophet did, he was revealed from God and he acted but he acted always with principle. When the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, he fought, he didn't fight with anger. He didn't fight out of frustration. He didn't just, just strike out blindly and just kill everybody. No, he didn't do that. The prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said if we have to go to war to support the truth, because you know, truth has got to be defended. You can't tell me that just love everybody, somebody come in your house to rape you and your family, you gotta love him too. <laughs> No, if you got a gun in your house or, or, or something you can grab hold of and somebody come in your house to rape your wife, you know you have to fight that person. And if you had to kill him to get him to stop from killing your family, that's justice. And everyone could see that. A woman who is being raped by a man and she can grab hold of something and hit him and he dies. Nobody can say that she murdered him. Self-defense. So in the cause, in the defense of what is right, sometimes human beings themselves have got to defend what is right. And sometimes that defense leads to major conflict. It's called war. But the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, he said that when we go to war, we go to war because it has been ordered by God. And there are principles even to war. Principles even in war. And only the people who carry weapons. We only fight the people who carry weapons. We don't fight innocent people. We don't fight old people. We don't fight interned people. We don't fight sick people. We don't just go and get on a bus and blow up a bus. We don't go to a hospital and blow up a hospital. We don't just blow up a bridge, just do as much damage as we can, so now check that out. <laughs> we, we don't do that. Now, those who have done something like that, I'm not their judge. But we don't support that. And if some Muslims have done that, we are sad for them.
because they will have to answer for that. And they will have to tell God what their justification is about that. But let's go to another issue. When we talk about terror, terror is the wrongful destruction and bringing trauma, disease, misery upon human beings without justification. That's what terror is. So when the Spanish went into South America, they were called, who, what were their names? The conquistadors. And they totally dislodged those people, took their lands, killed them. 29 million, and you keep counting, I'm gonna tell you about some terror now. 29 million, the conquistadors killed over a period of 86 years. How many did I say? 29 million. When the Afrikaners, the Dutch, went into South Africa and took that part of the land they call now South Africa, over a period of 65 years, they displaced, murdered, killed, executed 37 million. How much is that? Add that up. 37 and 29 is how many? So that's 66 in my book. Let's keep adding. When America, when Columbus and his boys went to America, and you know what I said last night, how you, how you discover somewhere that some people is living already? <laughs> and you already know it's not India. You were sick when you got there. You were headed to India, but you landed over there, but you still call them Indians. <laughs> and over a period of 200 years, you displaced those people. You poisoned their stream. You killed their buffalo. You took their land. You took and put them on reservations. You extinguished those people. It totally extinguished those people. And so that today, you call them native Indians. But they have nothing. And so you wipe those people out. 38 million. So add that on to 66 now. And somebody keep count over here. <laughs> Let's move on. We talk about terrorism now. We're going to India. When the British went into India and would not even allow the Indian people to gather their own salt out of the ocean. They worked them like slaves and dogs for 140 years and would not even allow them to take their own salt from the ocean. And through systematic repression, execution, slavery, they wiped out more than 51 million people of India. Now add that, keep adding that. When the Americans dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they could have told the Japanese, we have a bomb. They could have demonstrated that bomb and the war was over. But they didn't. They wanted the world to see how that bomb acts. They wanted the world to see that bomb. And they wanted justification for the world to see that bomb. So they didn't tell the Japanese they had that bomb. They dropped that bomb. And I'll tell you what that bomb did, if you don't know. When that bomb was dropped, because actually there was three bombs, but I'll just tell you the one. When that bomb was dropped, before that bomb hit the ground, it incinerated. That means it turned the people into liquid. It liquefied the people. It liquefied 187,000 people before it even hit the ground. And when it mushroomed, 2.7 million people was just obliterated, totally finished, 2.7 million. And from that time until now, the cancer in that area still is present in the people. Now you tell me that's not terrorism. So I'll stop right there because I know you can't handle that. I'll stop there, I could go on. The whole so-called G8, I can tell you about terrorism. Well, I'll stop right there because that's 159 million. I won't even go into the 800,000 just recently that was massacred in Rwanda. You say, well, Africans killed Africans, but I'll tell you why they was killed because the Rwanda government owed the central bank a debt and they wouldn't pay. So they created a civil war to kill off those certain people so a new government is there and now they're paying that debt. 800,000, now add that on top of it too. Now if that's not terrorism, what is it? But those are sophisticated criminals. Those are sophisticated terrorists. We forgot that, we read the history, but we don't say nothing about that. We keep talking about September 11th. I don't think that's fair. September 11th was a tragedy, and it was wrong. And I don't know who did it. Nobody else has, who has specified 
No one has brought any evidence of exactly who did it. But whoever did it, I believe it's wrong. And I feel personal about that because I was born just two miles from there. I just, I wouldn't happen to be there. I feel personal about that. Whoever used my home as a place of reprisal for their frustrations, I don't think that's right. Whether they were Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or anybody else who did it. But 3,000 people in one day and some buildings that fell down and whatever amount of collateral damage, that's not like 156 billion, I mean 166 million, and nobody has made an official apology. I ain't even talking about the aborigines. I don't want to hurt y'all people. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about the aboriginal people here, what happened here now. Because I'm a sociologist. I know exactly what happened. And it's a tragedy that most Australians don't even want to talk about. They have the highest alcoholism rate in, the, in, in this whole part of the world. The drug, the drug addiction, you say it's their fault. It's not their fault. It's their fault directly, but indirectly they were put in that condition. In order for you to enjoy yourselves, they're kept in that condition. But I don't have to tell you about your history. I'll tell you about my history. And I thank God that I was born in America, the great-great-grandson of ex-slaves. And I thank God I'm not a slave today except for God. And this is the chance that all people have to serve God, to stop being the slaves of others. So terrorism and fanaticism, yes, there are some Muslims that are guilty of that, but there are others who are not Muslims that are also guilty of that. Would you say is that right or wrong? And as for fanaticism, yes, some Muslims are extremists. They are fanatic. And there are also Christians that are fanatics. And there are Jews that are fanatics. And Buddhists and Hindus that are fanatics. And, and communists that are fanatics. And others that are fanatics. So why, when you think of the word fanaticism, extremism, why do you think of Islam and Muslims? Because the media has made us think in our minds that whenever that word comes up, repression, fanaticism, extremism, automatically start looking at Muslims because we've been conditioned to think that way, and that's unfair. That's conditional pre prejudice. You've been prejudiced. You've been conditioned to have prejudice against people. You haven't examined those people. You didn't look for the facts. You didn't ask, were they guilty? Did they do anything? This is my neighbor. I see them every day. Why do I have an attitude when I see them? When I look at the news, I got an attitude with my neighbor. What's the, what's the reason for that? The media have caused us to become adversaries. And my job here is to tell you that Islam is a beautiful religion, if you want to call it that. It's a beautiful system, if you want to call it that. And all human beings should be Muslim. Does anybody here think they should worship themselves? How many people believe that if there is a God in the heavens, if there is a God and a creator of the heavens and the earth, if there is a God that gave you and I life, this gift of life, that that God is the benefactor and that is the one that should be recognized? Some people. See? Now, I, I don't believe that everybody raising their hand is Muslims and you're just agreeing with me. This makes common sense. And this is what Islam means. To take common sense and to bear witness that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator. Yeah, I just let this lady please down. Just let, let our um, auntie, let her down please. Let her walk down. Just you, you, young, you, you young sisters, move out of her way and let her come down here. Just move out of her way. Help her come down here and sit down next to her husband. Thank you very much. The Prophet them said, whosoever does not give respect to our elders and is not tender towards our young is not from us. That's what the Prophet them said. Whoever is not gentle with our children and respectful towards our elders is not from us. So whenever we see an elderly person on a bus or on the underground or whatever, we give them the seat, we help them, we walk with them, we give them the honor just because they got gray hair, just because they've been in front of us, and by doing that, God will be pleased with us. That's the nature of this religion. It's about respect. It's about character. It's about behavior. So Islam... It's not a foreign, it's not something foreign, it's not something extreme, it's not something on the outside, it's not you and us. That's not what it is. 
It's for the world. It is the final revelation. The Quran is a book of 6,626 verses. And in it, there is a remembrance about Moses and Abraham and David and Solomon <coughs> and John the Baptist and Jesus Christ and all the prophets, a, re a reminder about them. It's a story about human beings in there. It is a revelation from God. It is an inspiration from God. It is a legislation from God. That's what the Quran is. And it is a final revelation. You will not find any book like it. You go home tonight and put in Encyclopedia Britannica. Let it pop up. Then after that, put the word Quran in there. Put the word Islam in there. Put the word Muhammad in there. And see what the authorities who have compiled the Encyclopedia Britannica, what they say. Because they're objective. You don't have to say the Khalid said, that guy who was talking said. See what the Encyclopedia Britannica says. This is, a, this is an objective source of information. More than 347 different scholars from all different walks of life have collaborated on this source of knowledge called the Encyclopedia Britannica. See what they say about the Quran. They said that it is the only alleged revelation that has come to a human being that has remained intact since he brought it. That's what they said. They say it is one of the most phenomenal books of literature in the entire world, for it has made some prophecies that came about. And Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he couldn't have known that. The Quran says, وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمْرُ إِذَا مُسْتَقْرِدْ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ How the Prophet knew that. How he know that the sun and the moon both follow a, a, an ordered course for it? How they know? How do you know they were rev revolving? وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمْرُ إِذَا مُسْتَقَرِدْ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ that it is in order, a taqdeer, a qadr, from Aziz al -Adil. The Prophet didn't know that. He wasn't no astronomer. He, he, he had one of them uh, telescopes like Hubble. How did the Prophet know that inside the womb of the mother, that the child is hanging from a clot? How did he know that? The Quran said, and verily we have created you from nutfa. What nutfa? Nutfa in Arabic means sperm. After nutfa, the Quran says it becomes alaq, a clot. And alaq means something hanging. So how did the Prophet know that after the sperm enters, it becomes a zygote? And then after that, it becomes alaq, clinging to the womb and then hanging. How did he know that? The Quran already called it that. How did the Quran know that after it became that, it becomes something called mudra? Something looked like it had been chewed. And if you look at the, the, uh, the, the, the embryo, when it is about six weeks, five weeks, it is looking like what? A chewed piece of flesh. Then after that, the Quran says it becomes a lump of flesh clothed with the skin. The Quran said that. Then it said after that, we give to it its features. It gives its features its eyes, its ears, its brain, its spine. Its, it gives its pancreas, its liver. It gives all the features and systems come within how many weeks? 14 weeks, 16 weeks. The Quran gave that system. And then after that, he said that, it becomes shay'un akhar, another creature means fully formed. So the Quran, it gave the stages of embryo, it gave the embryological stages inside the womb. How does the prophet know that? He had no stethoscope. He had no ultrasound. But the Quran said that. How does the Quran say, verily we have created everything from water. What has been discovered now? What's the whole world made of? Gas. And what is the basic comp composite of water? H2. Oh, how the Quran, how do you know that? How the Quran said, called the, called the sun, Shams. Called the, the, called the light of the sun, Wahaj. And called the light of the moon, Munira. Munira means reflection. It does not have its own light. Wahaj means burning bright. So how did the prophet know that the sun was burning bright and that the moon had no light of its own, but that it was a reflection, Munira? How he know that? 
I could give you 37. Thank you, brother. You give, give everybody else some water, too. <laughs> I could give you at least 37 statements in the Quran, and 23 of them have just been discovered in the last 40 years. And this is not what Khalid said. You'll find that in the writings of Mushtashrikeen, Orientalists, who have studied the Quran in the Arabic language and said, it's a book like no other book. We don't know how the Prophet could have said that. That's why Keith Moore, an embryologist, he said, after he read the Quran and he saw what the Quran said about the creation of the human being, he said, I have to believe this is a, this, God, the, Muhammad couldn't have said that. He couldn't have seen that, he couldn't have known that. He had to receive it from somewhere. So where he received it from, he couldn't receive it from no men. Nobody could have collaborated with him. There was nobody at that time who could have known that. The only way he could have known that is that it was revealed to him. Who was it revealed by? <coughs> Creator. So I say to all of you good people here who are non-Muslims, you need to read the Quran. Read it, it's open for you. And now you've got no excuse. You don't have to say, well, I don't have a Quran. I don't know where to get a Quran. If you've got a computer, you can read the Quran on your computer. And if you don't have a computer home, you got, still got no excuse. You go to the public library. <laughs> See? So everyone has a chance to read the Quran. Either you say to yourself after you read it, this is a book that seemed like this is a book from God. Or you can say, no, I don't believe that's that, that book. I don't believe that at all. I'm going to follow some other book. That's up to you. Read about the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and I'll tell you about him. There's a couple of statements I want to make to you, and you can compare. I'll say to you that there's no other human being in the annals of history that can compare categorically with him. Not your father, not your uncle, not your grandfather, not, the, not your, your mentor, not your, uh, your professor in school, not the president of your country, not your husband. Nobody that you can think of historically that can categorically compare with the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Nobody. I don't say that prejudicially. I am a bit subjective about the matter. But I'll tell you a man by the name of Michael J. Hart, somebody you would believe, I think, one of the foremost biographers, historians of our time, himself and a group of 67 other biographers, they did a study. And they want to find out the 100 most profound human beings in the annals of history. And you can go into the library and you can check this out, too. So you don't say, this is Khalid said that. No, Michael J. Hart said that. Him and a group of other 67 people. And they studied, and they made a category. Their category was 30 different criteria, 30 different categories in which they judged human beings. Bonaparte, Napoleon, Winston Churchill, Moses, David, Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, President Lincoln, President Washington, this one, that one, Delano Roosevelt, France de Gaulle, I mean Buddha, Confucius. They just checked everybody, Gandhi, everybody. They check, check, put you up there too. <laughs> They took the most profound, widely known historical figures, and they put them into this category. And Michael J. Hart said that, honestly, for me, my selection as a Christian, my selection would have been Jesus Christ. But there were at least five categories that I could not choose Jesus Christ, because five of the categories had to do with that he was categorically the best father. He was not a father. He was categorically the best husband. He was not a husband. He was categorically the best statesman. He was never a statesman. He was categorically the best ruler. He was never a ruler. So he said, even though my choice would have been Jesus Christ, when the comparisons came down to three, those three were Jesus Christ, Moses, and Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. And guess who Michael J. Hart, with the collaboration of those other 67 biographers, guess who they chose? They chose Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. That's not a Muslim chose, Muhammad. Michael J. Hart is a Christian. And I think he has a little bit back, better background bi biographically than you do. And 67 other collaborators with him studied that, looked at it, and this is a fact. Go to the archives of Time magazine, and it's there. And if any one of you send me an email, I'll send you a copy of that article. It's there. So they chose. So I say, even maybe they 
were not correct. I say, you make a judgment. You do the same study that they did. You look at the same categories that they did. You're fair, you're just, you're intelligent, you're intellectuals, and you, I know you're objective, and I know you will read, and you make a determination and you see. We don't say what Michael J. Hart said. We'll just say that Muhammad is a prophet of God. If he is a prophet of God, then that's the second thing I want you to acknowledge. You acknowledge that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator. I want you also to acknowledge that Muhammad is a prophet of God. If you have no reason to reject that, you have no reason to believe other than that, then you should be willing to say that Muhammad is a prophet of God. He must have been a prophet of God. The book that he brought, the life that he lived, his connection to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ prophesied him, and he confirmed Jesus Christ. He must have been a prophet of God. He was a prophet of God, a cousin of the other prophets. He came from a brother of those who was under Abraham. He must have been a prophet. He must have been a messenger. Categorically, he stood on a platform of dignity and high honor. And that's what Allah said to, about him in the Quran. وَإِنَّكَ عَلَىٰ خُلُقِ الْعَظِيمِ Verily, O Muhammad, you have been set on a platform of dignity and honor for all human beings to look at and to follow and to examine. And the other thing that they categorize is that which one of their lives have been documented the most? And who do you think it came to? Muhammad. So we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa fil alameen inna ka hamid wajid. Allahumma barak ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa fil alameen inna ka hamid wajid. We say, Allah, bless Muhammad and all the followers of Muhammad and bless